What do you think of that Star Wars movie? Which Star Wars movie? The one I made with my nephews and nieces. Oh, yeah. I really liked all the transitions that you got. <laughs> the wipes. Yeah. Makes it feel like Star Wars, right? Real Star Wars. I uploaded it to YouTube, and within like 20 seconds, it was like, you have violated two copyrights for these songs. <laughs> really? <laughs> yeah, and it shows... It shows... Um, Did they remove it? The or? songs. I think they just never posted it. I was just doing it so we were going to watch it on the TV, but we just hooked up my laptop anyways. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, if you're planning on making a Star Wars movie... Using official sound, you can't do. You can't do that. You're not allowed. <laughs> cool. Should probably explain why you were making a Star Wars movie. Oh yeah, I was. Um, well, we make movies now, so we have this skill. And then my nephew got an X-wing and a Tie fighter and um, Kylo Ren's, um, you know, fighter jet thing. It's not what it's called, but there's some name for his ship, which it looks awesome. It looks like a wing thing, and he built them all. He builds these things in like no time. And they're, they're like 600, they're 800 Legos. pieces. Like they're yeah, like Legos. actual Legos. Yeah, it's like a TIE fighter that's like this big. And it's like 800 pieces and the X-Wing is like a thousand. The X-Wing wings open up so they start like this and then they open into the X, you know? And you can like, <laughs> and then you can like shoot guns and stuff. Dude, when I was a kid, we had like three Lego blocks. You that's know? what, that's and what you Dan was creative. saying. Yeah, Dan was like, we never got instruction manuals. You get like a box full of legos you just put things together until they look cool but like these are crazy oh and then we went to the mall of america which has the lego store which had a thing uh it had like voltron and it was like a million pieces it was like it was like no no, no. what what is it was Vol a million and then there was another thing that was like over two million pieces what is it, what is voltron transformers it's, it's i don't know it has like an animal on its arm i think it's like a its own thing I think it's something I didn't grow up with. But um, yeah, it was like a million pieces. You're just looking, looking at this thing. It's massive. It's like on top of the roof of the thing. And it's like, yeah, it's a million Legos right there. Yeah, good good training for uh, tomorrow's uh, programmers. Yeah, really. Yeah. And like Asher is really good at piecing things together. And he also makes his own stuff. He's just like really good with that stuff. So it was pretty cool. Nice. So anyways, we like filmed all on the um, the iPhone. And it was cool because... Man, like, in terms of just the tools available, I, like, made videos when I was growing up just, like, in little silly ways with, like, different programs and stuff. Or, like, I shot my camcorder, you record it to the thing, and then you have to get the cable and plug it in and transfer it and import. So what we did was just use my iPhone, and it's all hooked up to iCloud. And so we're just, like, sitting there recording, like, 30 different takes. And I kind of was, like, the director. I had in my mind, like, how I wanted the shots to go. And um, <laughs> and then by the time we go to the MacBook to start a new Final Cut project, they're all in my iCloud photos. I just drag them all in. And then we had to get voiceovers for some of the dialogue. And I just use the Memos app on the iPhone. And there's now a Memos app on like OS X that has it all synced. So there's no transferring. All the assets were just there. And I just pulled them in. We like Googled for like sound, Star Wars soundboards and like pulled all the sound effects in. Nice. It was awesome. And they, they they were like, yeah, it was just cool. I think like still the process of going to Final Cut and like moving those things around is like, you know, we've been making a lot of movies the last two years, so we're good at that. My brother-in-law was watching me and he was like, I can't even see your fingers moving. You're moving so fast. You know, like, what is this? It's like magic. You, you, you should be like, hey, you should see me in Vim. <laughs> but there is like, I think Asher was like eight, Phoebe's like 10. And I think they could, they could probably do something pretty soon, you know, if not already. But like you could imagine simplifying that too. Like you could imagine if you wanted to optimize that entire use case where you're like shooting on an iPhone, dialogue with the memos app into a place that has like transitions and music and you're just making a movie like multi-cam movie. It's like you could make that really easy. It's yeah. already almost there. I mean, even for the videos that we make, Final Cut, people make movies in Final Cut and we don't. We need screencasts. We need like more constraints. And I think this is like the a good case for like, yeah, constraints are good. Constraints simplify things. So yeah. Yes, definitely. We've talked about that before. Where like people comment on our videos a lot and say, like, that's really awesome. Like you guys people have said like you must have studied how to make movies or film or and like, no, we didn't. No. But um you can imagine a tool that makes that stuff a lot easier. Yep. You just switch between the two. You have a transition that automatically does it and, and all that good stuff. But um, Final Cut's awesome, though. Final Cut is just like great software. It really is. I mean, how easy it made it, how fast it is. It's 
sometimes I get depressed being a web developer thinking about my favorite applications are like Keynote and Final Cut. And like Ryan Florence had this tweet about the Twitter app. Did you read that? No. I think I retweeted it because I read it like a few days ago. He was using the Twitter um, mobile web app, which is like a progressive web app yep. um, for Twitter, like completely. He deleted the app from his phone. He installed it as like a home screen app on his iPhone and was using that exclusively for like, you know, the last year or six months or something like that. And he's like a popular guy on Twitter, so he probably uses a lot, DMs a lot, all this stuff. And um, he's going back to to the native app. And he was like, this is the best progressive web app I've ever used. Like hats off to the team. They did an amazing job. But still um, not still not good enough. Yeah. And um, it might actually be interesting to pull it up because there were the, the reasons why were like not necessarily what, we, what you would think. Um, you know, every every company I've talked to about making a PWA and not even PWA, just making a, a mobile web app. It, it's always comes off as is not for performance, not for usability, but for for cross platform. Mm-hmm. And so it's hard. So you're saying if there's, you're trying to I compete with a, like an iPhone app, yeah. and you're on an iPhone, you're not going to get a better experience than an iPhone app. There's also just such a massive trade off there. It's like they're they're apples to oranges. Right. Do you need it to work everywhere, or do you want yeah? Do you want right. the usability stuff that that's going to impress people like Ryan? Right. That's interesting too, because I was just thinking. Oh, I was at um, <laughs> I was at a bar last night watching the football game with my buddy, and we pulled up like this. He's like has a really good memory, and he was I was just like spitting off like questions about NFL, and he was just like answering them. So we were we ended up on Sporkle. Remember that website, Sporkle? No, they're like these quizzes that are like name all the team NFL teams in each division, and like you go through all eight divisions or whatever, or like you know, who won the championship in this year and stuff. And it went to the website, the mobile website is so bad. You can barely even use it. And then it's like obviously pushing you to the app, which costs money. It's just so silly. So that part of me is like, and you were just talking about this this morning with like the mobile app that was so bad. Um, it was like the Google app. Google, uh, Google uh, Analytics. Yeah, Google Analytics. Yeah. And like making a great website that's like responsive and works everywhere is like such a, that's such a valuable thing to do. But then this is a side of it where it's like trying to make it an app. There's just, it's kind of an interesting in between there. Yeah. I, I, yeah, I think you have to pick one. Yeah. You have to have really solid reasons. Yeah. And I, there, there's too much to compromise on to, to try to get every side right. Right. So <clears throat> my first, my first Ember app was, was a, a, a mobile app that ran on iPads and tablets. And it was, yeah. It was just really hard. It was to, rough. Yeah. Like to, you would have got the things you would have gotten for free from the platform, from the native platform, like the scrolling, the oh, UI there were stuff so would have been many, so much better. And there were so many little hacks we had to do. And, and, uh, Zynga scroller. Yeah. Zynga scroller, <laughs> my best friend. Um, what was it? It was just, yeah, it was just, you know, but we knew we said this thing's going to be cross platform and it's going to be buggy in some situations, but it's cross platform. Yeah. That. Now, why did you need a cross platform? Wasn't it a very constrained use case? Wasn't it like only an iPad? So the company I worked for wanted to to sell this app to major retailers, mm. and and having it work on Android and iPad was a huge, huge benefit. Ah, 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 ah gotcha. I was um, thinking about a different one you worked, yeah. I worked on. Also, oh, oh, yes, yes. No, that one was iPad only. Right. That was a super constrained environment, but um, yeah, it's just it was it was hard to. To, to build an app like it's that. trade-off it was yeah, a trade-off trade you're making yeah, yeah. yeah and that was i mean this was like five years ago so i can only imagine how much better the the ipad user experience has gotten mm-hmm. and and what users expect. expect right like when i use my iphone now i always swipe back. i know it's like the best on the bottom you're saying yeah on the bottom or on the side oh, oh yeah yeah so like i yes. just flip the pane back right and that's actually something he said so let me read this See, it said, all right, been using Twitter mobile as a pin to home screen app for over a month. Okay, only a month. For some reason, I thought it was more. Oh, after using it on desktop for months and enjoying it. It's good, but I'm going back to the native client. Here's why. Gestures. Safari makes any custom swipe back impossible. I can't reach the back button. So he's just saying, he's just saying, yeah, I'd rather be able to swipe back. So much flashing. <laughs> I'm guessing he means just like loading states and stuff like that. 
um, losing my place. If I switch apps and go back to Twitter, it starts over from the top of my feed. Ooh. So that's pretty interesting. Whereas like right now, I'm, I'm, I'm using Twitter right now. Well, I can just swipe along the bottom and then just go back. It's going to be exactly the same. I guess it resets when you probably some delay, probably some time period. On the other home screen app I worked on, we would always we would always reset if you exited the app and came back. Oh, you would op, you would do that on purpose? Like no, 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 no. Oh, it no, would. The, 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 the app operating, would. yeah. This is part of the contract with home screen apps, and so we had to. Uh, I think it like there were certain things I would cache in local storage. Mm-hmm. There were there were certain things I would cache in local storage, and based on what they are, it could put you in a new state or resume that state. Would it like refresh the URL to the home? Yes. Oh, wow. Yeah. Yeah, but then I think there were like there were weird things like, yes, it would That's refresh your. URL. I think I I saw in the web lo- web server logs a get request every time you you went back and forth. Wow, a get to index. So then you would have to store like the last visited URL or something like that. you could. That's something you could do in local storage. So yes, that when you reloaded it, it would go there. Local storage would save, and I think like this was so long ago, I don't remember. But I think like we had to store a, a token. Because a session would expire, oh, the wow. session would get wiped. So we'd have to store a token in local storage that would then get used to authenticate the user. That then would the backend would then set a cookie mm. for all future requests. So it's just like all these weird little hoops, like all these problems. They're all solvable, right? Right. And it's pretty simple solutions. But when you got five of them, yeah, and you're trying to build an app, and everyone's reinventing that stuff instead of working on business and UI yes. logic, like that's that's a problem. Yeah. I haven't gotten a video embed to work yet and no offline data. Offline data. So this is something that that we tried to to build and you get a five megabyte limit and then uh, the user gets a prompt that says like, do you want to up, up this to 15 or 10 or something oh, like weird. that? And all of the users that were using this app were people we've trained, but I, it was always awkward. The, and, and the you had sec- to tell them to do you, that. You had to tell them, or they would come up to me and they say, "What do I do here?" Yeah. Also, you can't make this thing user friendly because it's a it's uh, a native. Yeah, it's a native thing, and it's not something you would ever see from a native application. Yes. Yeah, because they just that's that's a really good point. It's not so. Yeah, when they see like a so it's uh, another uncanny valley kind of thing. Yep. Yeah. Hats off to Dev's mobile web Twitter's best app, web app I've used. They've seriously done an excellent job. Um, and he says, I wonder if we'd stop obsessing over bundle sizes and start obsessing over what the actual platform allows us to make. Then the web could actually make some strides as an application platform. Until then, it's great for documents, barely acceptable for apps. I want both. Nice. Pretty interesting. I thought that was pretty thought provoking. I, I, I also totally agree. Bundle size is just, I know such a stupid argument. <laughs> it's it, so, it really is. I mean, it's, I used to try to defend it. And now it's just so stupid. Again, it just comes back to what you're actually trying to build, you know. Um, Thinking about like website versus web app, like Ember Map is perfect as a website, essentially documents, videos, but it's essentially like a link graph of linked documents. Um, And size matters in the sense of like, we want it to be fast, but we're also streaming HD video. So in that sense, like a kilobyte threshold doesn't really make, as much sense you want to be able to navigate the around the site as quick as possible when you're yeah. walking around the city on your mobile for sure um but like all the other things playing rich video you know it's good that the web can has a video player that does all the stuff that it can do so that we can use it to play videos um so yeah there was a lot of interest i feel like you're holding back <laughs> <laughs> ah, i just uh, you know all the all the apps i've worked on the last five years just bundle you're, size has never ever yeah. been a metric and the biggest cost of the stuff that you're talking about has been like dev time of reinventing these primitives yeah. which sh- should be just like could be just things that come out of a drawer we had an app that was shipping six six and a half megabytes of javascript no one noticed no yeah. one cared yeah everyone just wanted more features they yeah. wanted to be able to do more stuff yeah and they would have been happy with like a smooth scroller or something like that even if, if, you, if you told them you could much. double the file size and you know add two new features they would say well, what happens if we quadruple it yeah, yeah exactly <laughs> yes well, why don't we get through some of these podcast topics <laughs> of ours i just want to rant <laughs> um i think i'll just say one more thing mm-hmm. i think most of most 
developers feel the way that Ryan does and what I'm saying right now. Mm -hmm. And they, they don't care about bundle size, but it's really hard to have that conversation because it's almost like you're guilty if you, yeah. if you don't have a budget and you, or you, you're shipping yeah. more than necessary JavaScript. Yeah. And it's, I think it's a silly conversation. I think, yeah, when you work with, with businesses and you talk about their goals, they right. just, they don't like, they don't care. And, th and there is an amount that's too much. Right. You know, with Ember map, we had to fast boot the site because right. just shipping JavaScript was too slow. Right. But we found ways to right. bend that trade off curve and it right. wasn't, there was, there was never discussion about bundle size. It was right. What's a goal we're trying to accomplish. And then what are all the options we have and what's yeah. the cheapest one? Yeah. And, but when you jump straight to bundle size, it's just your, your, it's an, it's not a good conversation and when people start doing it on twitter it's like they're just they're giving advice without even thinking about like how that affects the rest of the application how that like yeah how that it's affects not acknowledging the, the trade off to, to say yeah. that you have a hard deadline a hard constraint is, is suggesting that there's no it doesn't tell me that you're actually acknowledging the trade-offs that you're imposing on me or my team whereas the reality that the situation we face may present very different trade-offs from what you're describing or um yeah the downsides just might not be worth it yeah. or like you said there might be no, a cheaper way to achieve the goal it shouldn't be there should always be a goal in mind because that's why you're building the thing in the first place um and i also agree like the fact that it's become for some people um like basically in the realm of, of almost like political correctness to talk about it is like to me the things that are appropriate to be in the realm of political correctness are things that are so obviously wrong that it's like offensive to think otherwise. And those are things that we know so well that um, we should call people out for violating those norms because it's become to the, it's come to the point where we have such general acceptance of it, um, then it's worth calling those people out. And the question is like, is this is a JavaScript budget for your JavaScript application? Your, your bundle size budget for your JavaScript application reach that point where we truly understand so well the trade-offs involved, the costs involved, the benefits involved, that even thinking or suggesting otherwise is worthy of being called out in this kind of disparaging way. And I think the answer is definitely it's not. So obviously not. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I, you know, I will also say just before we put a button on this, say, that I think a, a, a lot of minutes later. Yeah. <laughs> A lot of Google developers, and I always call it Google. I, I really like Google. No, I, I did too. Um, but I think a lot of developers have been critical about this, had a lot of clout two or three years ago. Yeah. And I think now when they tweet, everyone just kind of rolls their eyes. Yeah. So, yeah. So maybe there's some reputation or kind of um, market test at work there. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that's interesting. Ember data stores across two browsers. Yeah. It's a fun one. This is this is one that's been on the list of things to talk about for a while. It has. And it also actually just came up. Um, Dan Abramov has started a blog. <laughs> Have you been reading it? Uh, I read one of them. It's like over overreacted. Yep. Okay. And yeah, he, I read one of them. And he had a great little um, email sign up at the bottom of his blog. And I signed up thinking I was going to get like a notification. Um when he posted something new, but it actually just sends you the, the letter, which or the actual blog post in your email, which is awesome because I I used to use RSS way back in the day. But I already have like a process for like reading Jonathan Stark emails or other people's emails in my e e inbox. So I find that much more than putting articles into Pocket, which I go through like every month or two, I'll go to Pocket and read a few. But if it's in my email, I love inbox zero. I'm most of the time I'm inbox zero. And so if I just have an article there that's going to take me three minutes or four minutes to read, I'll read it within a day or two. That's cool. So and so it, he sent the next one out. It um, emails you the actual article. Yeah, the blog post. Yeah, that's exactly. pretty cool. And this one had this topic, actually, because this latest one was like, basically, it's like fundamental problems of UI development. It's like why UI development is hard, which is also a good post to just have in your back pocket. If you ever do run into someone who's like, front end is easy, right? You can, this is a great summary of some of the harder points. Like the distributed states of exactly. data. Yeah. Exactly. And one of the things he talked about was like stale data. Um, so, yeah. I think I added this to our, our podcast list a, a few weeks or months ago when I think I was editing a video in our CMS and I uh, left the tab open. I told you to take over. 
Then you went in, you started editing it. And then I had to change something mm. like a week later. And I still had that tab open. Oh. And I went in and I made the change. And it was the week old data for my Ember data store that was just living in that tab. And when you I made clicked, your new change. I made my new hit change. Save. It saved. It wiped out everything. It even wiped out some relationships. Like you had uploaded a video and attached it and it had wiped it out. So that Last was, right wins, basically. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. in my data store, there was no video associated with it. Right. And when I click save, all that, those nulls get sent to the back end. Right. Uh, so this is not even just two browsers. Well, two users. I mean, two. It could have been two browser tabs on your machine. Yeah. You this could have been making changes on another browser and then found this old tab that was open that just had stale data. Yeah. But it became the source of truth. So how do you, like, how would you go about? That's pretty tough. Yeah. I mean, of course, there's lots of ways you can, one could imagine to solve the immediate problem. I think um, the deeper problem is, like, in general, the problem of stale data. I always think about, like, our conversation with Luke one time. He was just like, I just want, always want the latest data, always. Um in situations like this, you need to think a little bit more about how um, the source of truth is represented because you don't want to lose those changes. Let's say you're editing something and I make a change on my computer and save it. If you were to just have like Ember data pulling in the background and updating the identity map, then you could just have your changes lost out from underneath you. Mm -hmm. Another thing we've talked about in the past is that if you are making changes, um, like fork the store in one way or another, create a buffer proxy, create a draft post and change that in that way. Like, and that's really, I think more appropriate here, which is like, you're, you are working with client side state at this point. Now it might be useful to know what the canonical server side state is in the way that when you edit a stack overflow post, you can get a message that says you're not looking at the latest thing. Click here to refresh the original post. Yeah. I feel like the buffered proxy change set thing is, it's hard, but it's it's easy it's in the good. sense that everyone knows that you're going to run into this. And, and most UI teams, most Ember teams have encountered this. They have a way of fixing it. I think the Stack Overflow message thing is a harder thing to deal with. Right. Because in that situation, to, to, to create that UI, you need old identity map state, new identity map state, and your buffer proxy. So yeah. you basically need two copies, ideally like a log of... Yeah, or of the yeah, store. Yeah, or like you're just syncing like some counter with the back end. Right. You know, it's like your counter is one behind the back end, so this thing's out of date. That would be maybe the easiest way for you to let people know that you might not be looking at the freshest thing. Yeah. Basically, you're letting them know you might be in a situation where like this is not the same as if you were clicking around a website and you were always getting the freshest data. At the same time, like some of the apps we've worked on, you could imagine. If you were, if someone was in this part of the app and you were bug, bugging them every time someone made a change to another company over here, like that would be, maybe that's only actually 1% of the time. So most of the time the independent yes. rights can be going just fine. Yep. And as you navigate through the app, you're doing like background reloads and stuff. And that's going to be basically fine for most cases. But like this definitely is, this is the kind of thing you ideally would want a solution for that doesn't involve you having to run into the problem and then start thinking about it. Like basically you want a rule you want like every time i edit something i'm working with a draft just from the beginning even if you never have like concurrent users on the same screen just because it's just it works in the one case and it avoids the problem in the other so why not always do that yep. um and then you also want some way to like um yeah an easy way to like say that this thing needs to be fresh maybe like when you start editing post one you could like subscribe to the back end changes for changes to post one. And that way at the least, like the tooling could just provide you again with that counter. That's like post one has actually changed between now. And you could do that with something like rails with just post one mm -hmm. and the updated at yep. field. Um, I did. I, I spiked on something like this in, in Ember map. It was not close to production ready, but I had two Ember data stores, one that was hooked up to, Oh, normal. that's right. The live. Yeah. One was looked up to like just your normal fine record, find all mm -hmm. fetching. And the other was hooked up to a web WebSocket. And so you would, could compare the two stores. And if the WebSocket one was newer, you knew the thing changed. Two instances of the Ember data store. Two instances had. of it. Yeah. But there, cool. I mean, there's so many. This is like nice, but it introduces 10 more problems. You know, it's like one step forward, two steps back. So many assumptions are made around there being a single Ember data store. Yeah. 
also too, if I if we had to actually build this to solve this problem that we're talking about, this is like a really hard. I mean, this is really hard. This takes away from product development, right? Building all this, so right. yeah, yeah, it's yeah. hard. I think maybe in terms of the edges, but conceptually, yes, it's not terribly hard. It's pretty. It seems this to me feels like one of those frustrating areas where we're reinventing things. Teams are always reinventing their own things when this actually could be solved at a higher level. Yeah, yeah. I'm. Yeah, everyone runs into this problem. Right. At least every app I've worked on eventually runs yes. into this problem. You know, I I like that what you said earlier about how this isn't something you plan for. This is always something you notice like after it happens. Right. And that's, I think that's one of the really frustrating things about right. this is that like you weren't planning on fixing this incredibly hard problem. Right. And then all of a sudden someone comes up to you. It's like, Hey, what's, why is all my data missing? Right. That's the kind of problem you do not want uh, a hapless developer to um, just discover by chance. Like, and it's also the kind of problem that a backend developer would not like when you think about the kind of, um, progressive complexity where you want to start off with something basic but that is like a complete triangle in a sense you start off with a rails app and you add some like crud pages and authentication and everything's going to work the way you expect now you might want to eventually enhance the ui which means you're going to be opting into more complexity turbo links ajax of some sort whatever some view layer to add some more interactivity but you're choosing to do that at that point but out of the box, like everything is works as expected. Whereas like you could argue if you follow the cookie cutter bread and bread and butter, like Ember path, you could end up with very easily end up with an app that is like broken in this sense. Um, a lot of complexity. Yeah. Yeah. To me, like the router is an example of this being a solved problem in Ember where I've heard of folks who use React or another UI library that doesn't have the router constraint built into the architecture from the beginning encountering that problem later on and ending being able to easily have a broken app in the same way that when i used to write backbone apps like i could break them yep. um, in this way like the expectations of the user would be violated and like this is another example of that in ember so like the router thing is constrained enough that um yeah it's less flexible in some cases but you don't start out with a broken app but this data thing is very easy to like end up with a broken app so i think that's that's a sign that you could design an api that's more constrained somehow. I'm not sure what that would look like. Yeah. But basically like when you go to edit data, I mean, think about it. If you were designing something from scratch today and you could, you could take all the time in the world, like you, time wasn't an issue. Um, you would have these, these concepts would be first class citizens. Like when you go, when you're teaching someone how, using your Ryan framework, how to edit a post, you would build into it this idea that the post could go stale in between the time when the user wanted to start editing it and when they saved it. Yeah. And you would think of a first class way to handle that. Before the user starts editing a post, they have to they have to get checkout dash B <laughs> new post. <laughs> <laughs> then open a pull request when they're ready. Yeah, then you there you go. All your state management problems have been solved. <laughs> <laughs> That's true, you know. Git does have a conflict resolution <laughs> built into it. I mean, that that is funny. I mean, it, maybe that's to the point that like um, handling stale data and conflict resolution is actually a really tricky problem. And like, there's a few different ways you could do it. I wonder how like, I wonder how like these new tools that are basically like Git for Sketch and like for designers have, it's probably this very similar kind yeah. of thing. Um, I mean, even, even in a web UI, if you couldn't nicely merge Imagine two stores, one with server data, one with client data, and you're just merging them together and you get to a point where it's like, oh, they're both editing the same record. Right. There's at least like a pattern here where you could pop Block. up a modal. Yes, yeah. exactly. That's what you would do. Like and if say, you like, haven't thought about conflict resolution, I'm just gonna the, the default happy path is gonna be non-concurrent editing. So one editor at a time, and we're gonna build this all in such that when you go to edit, you actually in order to edit this, you need to have like an open connection to the back end so you know if anyone else is trying to edit it. And then you get like a mutex. Basically, it's like a mutex, like you lock it. Yeah. And like that's part of the pattern. It's like actually a constraint of editing anything because 
you want the tooling to solve this potential problem. You don't want to have to resolve this every time. Now, just just to push back here, is this like Yagni and all of a sudden I'm making like an Ember CRUD app, but my first week is just blown because I'm building this this mutex locking. No, but you shouldn't have to build it. That's the whole point. Okay, so if you were building the Ryan framework or whatever, okay. I'm saying if you were building a new framework today that was like stateful and you knew every single uh, user uh, of default, your framework, the default strategy is locking. Yes. and but then you know you need it to work offline. Yes. you need this. There's other patterns, that, other things that you can adopt. Yeah, exactly. That's not, that's not bad. Actually, I think this is what Medium does because when we had our blog on Medium, I think we would both be working on a post, and I would get a message that would say. You know, Sam is editing this post and it was like a modal, the grayed out screen. Yep. So this is a good default. Yeah. What would that look like? So if you wanted to edit something, you'd actually have to make like a get request or something or like a patch request first. You have to and you click. Yeah, edit. you'd have to get the lock. Right. You'd have to get the lock. Server would tell you, yes, you've locked this. And then I don't know, maybe <laughs> I love just making up APIs. <laughs> maybe there's something where it's like you have to communicate to the server every five minutes. And if you don't communicate, you've lost your lock or something like that. Right, right. So that if they go off, they don't like lock everyone else out. And you could imagine that this is, again, like the naive, simple strategy. You could imagine like based off the app you're building, you can get things where it's like maybe you can punt people out. Right. Maybe you're using data structures that can easily be merged. Right. And right. two people can edit at once. Right. But these are things that you would have to think about. Think about and opt into. Right. But yeah. Now, what would stop you from hitting edit? This is like a total just... <laughs> we're somewhere in we're in the middle of Ed, edge case land. Montana right now. <laughs> what if you you hit edit and so you render a form on the client side, but like you need to tell the user that like you are only actually editing if you have a lock. Um, it's like hitting the edit button would need to make a request, basically. Yeah, yeah. So it would it would be like you would click edit, wait for confirmation, yeah. and show that. And you'd want to build that constraint into the framework so you almost like so you couldn't create an edit form. So maybe like set. Maybe there's like a you can't call set. Yeah, you can't I was about to say that you can't mutate the model. And so like model maybe that's a maybe it's like creating a, a draft or something is like an asynchronous operation. It gets you a lock, gives you a draft. Um I don't know. <laughs> I mean, there's, there's, be interesting I like to actually write this out. Yeah. I, I, but I really do like starting with something that's super constrained, yes. super naive. And the happy path doesn't get you into a bad spot right. as easily as the tools that we have now. And then as you want to introduce that really hard complexity, like merging models, there right. is a path. It's going to be difficult, right. but there is a path there. It'd be interesting to talk to Dan about this um, because yes. I know he's thought a lot about this with Orbit. Yep. And yes. I know Orbit already has some sort of, some solutions for this, but I wonder like how they would deal with that default happy path what's the right way to do that that's great that's a really great question for him yeah we should also get more guests on the show this year you know yes i get kind of get tired of listening to your voice every week <laughs> laravel add ascending and get a sorable table i don't get to respond to that <laughs> no <laughs> no wait well so what was this laravel you have some boston thing to say some <laughs> yeah. like slander from the from Saudi. Saudi. yeah <laughs> laravel um we were looking at laravel and admiring it and just saying that we were surprised that we were jealous of php developers um they have some really constrained tools like um rails active admin but like for laravel that's um like a really sweet it's like they have a lot of first party tools in the laravel ecosystem i was yeah i was gonna say it's like made by the the creators of laravel and it's the integration is just Beautiful. Everything yeah. about it is beautiful. It would be like as if DHH released a separate product called Rails Active Admin that was whatever, $10 a month or $99 a year. And he worked on it and like developed features for it and stuff. That's like what this guy does basically. And like he has a team of people working for him too. It's pretty cool. Um, and um, yeah, so he demos it at one of these conferences or something. And it's just like, oh man, it's so sweet how fast it is. We've talked about this before, like you own the front end and the back end, you can do things like, yeah, you render a table and he was like, oh, I want to make this sortable by this field. And like he went back to his controller method and the Laravel PHP code base and added like an arrow ascend, like ASC, and then like the table was sortable by that field. Yeah. I mean. And the idea of like also paginated and all this stuff, how to get a paginated sortable table in Ember to talk to your back end 
Yeah, I feel this is something you've said before, but the constraints. Yeah. The constraints is what makes this possible. Laravel, they own everything. They own the, the, the UI, the back end, the database connection. I mean, it's we're with Ember, where once we get to Ember data, just it has to be unconstrained. Yeah. It has to be. I mean, JSON API is much more constraints than we were working with three years ago. So yeah. that helps in a lot of ways. I mean, the, the querying the graph is it, actually it, like the closest thing we've gotten, like out of the box. Right. Like, wow, right. this is actually, it's as easy as. It does It does help in a lot of ways, but still Ember isn't a JSON API only framework. Right. And that's right. That's why you don't have an Ember table where you click sort. And First it, party. And it's, yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yep. Click sort and it sends that. API requests with minus ASC to right. the back end. And, you know. and those are all implementation details that you as a programmer no longer have to think about, which would be amazing. <laughs> For anyone who's listening wants to build that. <laughs> um, <laughs> they can build the store for forking first. Yeah. There's a few things they need to build. <laughs> YouTube uh, transition to UI pattern. Yeah, this is something I saw um, a few weeks ago where I was on YouTube. And you know when you're like, you're navigating around YouTube. They do this. Uh, they have like a bar at the very top of the page, and it's like a progress bar. Yep. So when you click a link, this progress bar is like moving, and then it, it finishes, and you transition. Mm -hmm. And so it's it's a way to get UI feedback in a um, client side app because you don't have the browser's normal. You know, I'm going to a new page. Right. Uh, so this, I think everyone's seen something like this. If you're not familiar with YouTube, but other single page apps do do something similar where they they give some feedback. What I thought was really cool about YouTube is I clicked a video or a link or something and I saw this UI pattern and it timed out. It like got to the end and it just it stopped and then a normal browser transition happened. Oh really? Yeah. So it's like so you're a full page refresh. So I got a full page refresh. I saw the browser's thing start spinning. I saw it load a new page and I thought that was really cool. It's like single page app your own special fast transitions with the, the, the single page app transition it falls apart when it's slow because the user is like what the hell is going on yeah, yeah, what yeah. state am i in yeah so this thing it like got to the end yeah maybe my, my memory is run out or like my well, maybe the data server is full of 2000 models and i really it would be way faster to do a full page and get the cache version of that page Just something like that some, something like it couldn't transition in in some some threshold some yeah. time out and it's just, just like okay i'm gonna fall back to the the default behavior i thought that was super cool that is cool so i was i was really impressed with that yeah that I is was, cool yeah i was it's really a, really impressed with that maybe we could just code in maybe we could code an add-on that like does that every like eight <laughs> route transitions to just give you like a free a fresh start because like you know start turn off off and on again I, and just build that in i have no confidence in your your ability to write ember right now <laughs> So I do window uh, window set timeout window dot reload. It's just an add on with an initializer <laughs> that like waits ran, that randomizes like every three to five route transitions or every ten minutes, whichever one comes first. Just like location dot reload or whatever window dot reload until I, someone builds store forking and all of the goodies that we need. I I think <laughs> I think something that could watch link twos and then manually transition to the URL would be super cool if it, if it takes too long yeah, or there's some error yeah, that would be that would be cool it's like a yeah one of the great things one of the great things about http is like when i'm transitioning between states if there's like an error or something goes wrong i just sort of rely on the browser and normal http behavior right, right. but when i submit a form in javascript I'm sort of responsible for controlling just that form part of the page. Totally. And now I have to handle like every type of error. Yeah, exactly. I was, that's exactly what I was just thinking. It might even be, sorry, go ahead. Yeah. So just something where like, now with forms, it's hard because post requests are hard for a client side. Post requests are hard to do in both a client side app and a single page app. Right. But right. sorry, a client side app and a server rendered app. But uh, something like get requests or transitions. Yeah. You could just have it. If something goes wrong, then you do like a manual browser like transition and then you can rely on all the goodies that are baked into the browser that's pretty good and like i mean all it definitely happens that people are using apps and something happens and you have to reload it and they just eventually do that yep but um yeah you can imagine some layer of the tooling doing that for you 
Yeah, I thought that I was like super. I just wanted to add that to our discussion because I was so impressed with, yeah. with it. It could be, um, yeah, it could be like more, even more generic than route failures. It could be like any sort of errors. Like, yeah, because like you can use an add on that's a calendar add on and it has an error and then your Ember app's just going to stop working. Like JavaScript is error, that's it, or something. Yeah. Not, and caught, you know. So, um, cool. This has been kind of a grab bag episode. Um, we're back from the holidays now. How was your, uh, how was your, uh, vacation? It's good. Yeah. You were in New York. Yeah. We stayed in New York. I was in the frozen tundra of Minnesota. <laughs> it was actually only got down to, um, last year I went as well. It was negative 15 degrees last year. Oh. This year it was a balmy 15 degrees. So we were running out on a lake. We were walking around on a frozen lake. You know, they, uh, they drive, people drive like F one fifties on lakes. Yeah, I feel like I knew that because they like they like cut holes in the ice and go fishing. Yeah, they bring and, like sheds out there. Yeah, yeah and they yeah. go ice fishing. They just sit there with their beer and their fishing poles and watch TV. And I was like, "Oh, that sounds like it could be all right." And my brother in law was like, "It sounds like the worst idea ever." I'm like, "You live here, don't you do that?" He's like, "I've never, I've no desire to do that at all." <laughs> but it was fun. We like swept a bunch of the snow off this part of the lake, and. Yeah, we were running around in our shoes playing hockey because <laughs> their friend's lake house had uh, like these hockey pucks. So we all fell like a bunch of times on the ice and like bruised up our legs, <laughs> but it was a pretty good time. <laughs> it's just cold there for like six or eight months. Yeah, I, I lived in Minneapolis for like two years. Who was the first person to go there to try settling Vi there as a Vikings. human? Vikings. And, and then the winter comes around. They're like, yeah, this is pretty good. Let's set up camp here. <laughs> like, who is doing that? That's a horrible idea. Why would yeah. they be like, let's keep going down where it's warmer. Let's just follow the warmth. It's like, mm, it's cold for about, uh, it was only cold for eight months, guys. Like, that's all right. We got three months of sun. Let's set up camp here. Every Everyone there was so obsessed with, like, outdoor activities. Hockey and stuff. Well, just, like, when it was nice out, everyone oh, yeah. would go hiking, running. There's, like, a... Uh, People have like jet skis. There's like a ton of lakes yeah, there. Yeah, but you're sa you're making it sound great. What about when it's negative well, thirteen degrees? Well, that's the thing. Is it for eight months? Everyone's inside. So then when it does get nice out, everyone's like, "Whoa, oh, they go I bananas. love the yeah. <laughs> yeah, they go. But it's it's just because they're stuck inside all year. Right. Right. Um, I saw a post on. It might have been on been on discuss, but it was about uh, the Ember like Ember build environments staging not staging, production, development, and test. And I think someone was asking like, oh, should I add a staging environment? And I know this is something you've run into with Mirage. Mm -hmm. And I figured this would be like a good thing for us, mm. us to talk about. What the kind of best practice is. Yeah. So I think, I think to, I'll, I'll start this with saying that um, you should only ever have three environments. So you only ever have production, development, and test. You never add production to, you never add staging. You're staging should be the production build environment and then you can configure that with like env variables or some other like i think like you can do like deploy targets but your your actual build environments are, are just only those three and you're configuring production to run in different environments is tricky because it like overlaps a bunch of things well the, the first concept is the is the build environment versus the deploy environment so i think that's what so when i said when i'm talking about environment right now i'm talking about the build environment right and so the idea is you only ever have have the three built environments. I know, I like I said, I know you ran into this with uh, Mirage. Yeah, the reason was for that was that there was parts of like Ember's code base um, and other add-ons as well that rely on those strings being there or not there. So you can imagine like if environment is not equal to the string production. So then you wouldn't want to use staging because like maybe it's not minified, but you'd want it to be minified in your staging server. Um, because you could have a bug due to minification or other things that only happen in production. Idea with staging is you want to get it as close to production as possible. So, um, yeah, I, I think there was. I did remember talking to like Robert at one point about this, and you know they had talked about the idea of supporting more environments. But I think at this point, it's still the safest bet. This is just stick with the default environments: development, test, and staging. There's also, yeah, the, I think maybe the thing you're talking about with Mirage too is. The thing where you can run tests in two ways. One is if you run Ember serve, you can visit slash tests and run your test suite. The other is you can run Ember test dash serve and visit localhost like 7357 and see your test suite. 
And there were some bugs, especially in the early days of Mirage, but things that would come up because in the first case, if you run Ember serve and then you visit slash tests, you're looking at an Ember app built with a development environment, a build time environment of development, but a runtime environment of test. Yeah. So if you can imagine like, let's say in your index.js file, you have if environment equals 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 um you know development app dot import or let's say if environment equals equals test app dot import you know sign on dot js that's build time so if you run ember serve your app is not being built with a build time environment of test as development so that maybe that node asset wouldn't be imported on the flip side, if you had something at runtime, like an initializer that happens after your Ember app is booted and starts running in JavaScript memory, that thing has an environment of test, even if the app was built with a development environment. So that's where those things can get out of sync. And in the early days, especially, it was like definitely recommended to always use test for both. Like basically have the environments lined up. Like if you're doing a runtime thing of test, it should be built on a thing of test as well. Recently, I heard Robert say, you know, you already have an app built, like let's just use slash test because you already have an Ember app built. Yep. So that's kind of suggesting that the build time configuration shouldn't change much between dev and testing. Um, but like, again, this is still, this is just an area where like subtle bugs can, can crop yep. up. Yep. So for the most part, we still use Ember test dash surf. So Ember T space dash S and that will build your app and run your app with both environments we test. Um, and then, yeah, like the deploy for the staging stuff, you know, we use Ember CLI deploy, which has this nice concept of deploy targets. So you can have an app built with production, which will make sure it's built with all those production flags, um, um, satisfied. Like if app is not production or is production, that'll happen. But then you can have a deploy target of staging where you can configure, like you were saying, environment variables. That's like, what's the Stripe key or what's the AWS key or what is the um, root URL or something like that? Yeah. So this is something we've also, uh, in the last few years, adopted in like our backend strategy too, where we we only have test development and production, but then we have different production environments. You know, we have real production, we have staging, we have review apps, but the way the way we configure those are all built for production. They just have different environment variables. That kind of tr that kind of switch certain. Yeah, things. that would change the behavior. Like one would have a production. But the idea is you start with production and then make slight tweaks in a sense. Yes. Instead yes. of like starting with a staging environment. Right. Right. Because I think this was popular at one point in Rails where you would make a whole new environment, mm -hmm. set it to staging. Uh, but I think that the environment setting environment variables is is a better. It's cleaner in the sense that you only have to change one thing when you're setting up a new environment. You're not introducing a whole new environment into your application. Right. So, right. yeah, I thought I thought this was interesting with, with Ember. And again, it's not always obvious. When you hear the word production environment, it's not always obvious what right. that means. So. Right, right. It's a little bit of um, ambiguity in the framing, in the, in the phrasing there. Cool. There was a, I was just going through some Mirage issues that cropped up over break. And there was one interesting one talking about, actually this guy had started making like a UI for different scenarios. Oh, cool. And I was kind of telling him like, we're thinking about working on something similar. Um, it's just interesting because this kind of has come up a lot in like the last month, maybe just because we've been talking about it. But basically we've talked to like four or five people who have basically hit points where the data creation has become so complex that it's like they need a better way to do it than just something out of the box. So like that to me points to like a need for some sort of shared solution. And um, yeah, UI could be really good for this. So, you know, that's gonna be something that we're gonna try to focus on this year and see how far we can get with that. See if there's a way we can work on that in a sustainable way. But um, yeah, that's something I'm looking forward to in 2019, so. Nice. That's about it. I don't really have any resolutions or goals for 2019 other than that. <laughs> And like, don't get fat and like, don't waste a lot of money. I like how like, I, I aim in, low. Your, in your younger days, you're like, I'm going to work out this much. I'm going to save this much money. And then like you hit a point, it's like, just don't get fat. Don't spend a lot of money. No low. Don't, it's like the Taleb stuff. Don't, you don't want to be exposed to anything drastic. That right. Just wipe you out. <laughs> right. Risk of ruin. <laughs> exactly. No, now it's like a trendy thing this year. It's like not have goals. Have you noticed this? 
Oh, really? Yeah. I see people on like in some of the like the kind of um, small business. Every, like everyone's, solo a contrarian. everyone's a contrarian these days. Exactly. So maybe we should jump back on yeah. the goal train. We'll start a blog post like Dan, Dan starting a blog was like huge. You know, it's like so mind blowing because like everyone got rid of blogs, went to medium. And now we're starting blogs again. RSS feeds are going to come back, you know. Hey, hey, I we set up an Ember map RSS feed. It's pretty cool. And it's awesome. <laughs> No, it's really, it, I'm not being sarcastic. It really is cool. Like we publish a video and then like we get a Slack ping because it's just a Slack channel that's subscribed to the RSS feed and it's like, oh, you got a new video. It's pretty cool. Yeah. Um, no goals. What was I going to say? Oh, yeah. It's just like with some of the solopreneurs that I follow, like the folks kind of doing their own, like whether it's info products or small SaaS companies. The, the the thing I like about it, I'm kind of ha- saying it with t- tongue in cheek, but I do think the whole idea with like the atomic habits stuff, it's like you want systems over goals. There are some bad things about goals. The idea being like, it's just something that you are always looking towards. And then like, if you miss, let's say your goal is like make a hundred thousand dollars and then you make $95,000 and you're like upset at yourself, but yeah. like you made $95,000, it should be, you should. And then also like, once you're done with that goal, what's beyond it you're back to square one instead you want like a system or something that's like going to be more it's basically goals on a smaller level um you know we even did this with like ember map where we started making two videos a week and that was way better than when we tried to make like 12 week goals and all this stuff things too, things change yeah when in that time frame and you know um even if like your system is not optimal for whatever reason Sometimes just having a system, one podcast a week, two videos a week, and just being able to check those boxes and it removes some of the decision fatigue. I, I, I like that the feedback loop is a lot smaller yes. and you can tweak it. So if we said we're going to make 100 videos over the next year right, uh, and we get halfway through the year and we've only made 30, right, we're going to freak out. right. But if we said we're going to make two videos a week, we can just keep keep changing those dials. Right. So. Right. The two videos a week thing has been great. It's been great. Constraints. You make different videos than you would if you did 30 videos a, a year or whatever. Um, you just make different. It, but but those are also part of the usefulness. It's Part of it is like it's the same thing like the, the, the scope as a function of the deadline. It's admitting that you actually don't know everything. And so let's just let's take a shot, stick to it for a little bit so that we can actually just focus on it and then go to the next thing. Hey, this is. I just want to tie this back to something because I just had a light bulb moment. But in the beginning of the year, we had higher churn. And like January, February, our churn was pretty high. Mm-hmm. And our we had a goal to reduce churn. Mm-hmm. But the way we solved that was by making two videos a week. And I was just looking at our churn graph mm-hmm. and it goes down. Mm-hmm. I mean, the, you can clearly see the churn just went down throughout the year. And also anecdotally, we, we added an exit survey when people cancel and they tell us why they cancel. And they stopped telling us it was because we've seen all the videos. Yes. Right? Yes. Yeah. You're just saying the difference between like the goal and like the actual solution. Yeah. I think that if in January the goal was to reduce churn, mm-hmm. I think it would have been. And we were thinking about like a I six think, month horizon or something. Yeah. Or a year over the next year. I think if we get to June, I'd be freaking out. Right. Are we reducing churn? Right. Is this the best thing? Do we, should we totally change directions where? Two videos a week was just two videos a week and just, yeah, sometimes I couldn't make a fancy video. So it was just, uh, right. there was an add on I wrote, let me walk you through it. Right. And like those Turns videos, out that was what people wanted yeah, to see. Those videos were popular. Right. But this is another way to tie this back to what I've been thinking is I started this other book called, um, nail it, then scale it. And, um, maybe we can talk more about it next episode, but it's talking about how you should focus on like solving a product problem before trying to grow too much. Tying it back to our videos, the idea is like they have this great quote in there that says um, entrepreneurs innovate and customers validate. So the idea that like instead of sitting around, I think two years ago we would have been like, how can we solve churn? Instead, we can just pick something, go with it, and then it turns out like the customers let us know if it was the right move or not. So, um, yeah, it's pretty interesting. It's pretty good not worrying about if this is going to be the a good move just it's just putting yourself in a perspective that you actually don't know the answer so instead of just sitting around and like let's look at these numbers and whiteboard 
why don't we just figure out the easiest way to try something and something like two videos a week, we're going to learn a lot in two months, as opposed to like six months from now, what do we want this number to be? Or like, what do we want this goal to be in this year? Like, why don't we just start try a new process that we do have some intuition about? That's where the innovation comes from. We have some ideas based on all the people we've worked with, all the people we've taught, the, the stuff that we have taught in our videos and, and the open source work we've done. But let people tell us whether it's actually a solution or not. Kind of keeps the book talks about keeping you kind of humble about this, keeping you as a mind of an experimenter or a scientist and thinking that you're really putting out hypotheses that you need to validate or invalidate and let people tell you whether they work or not. So especially with this Mirage stuff this year, we want to think about, I, I want us to think in this way as well, to think what are the true problems, the real pain points that people talk about when it comes to things like maybe creating fake data or spinning up a demo server to show clients. Like I want to identify those things and then try different hypotheses and let people validate or invalidate them. Awesome. I'm excited. Yeah. <laughs> cool. Well, I hope everyone has a wonderful new year and it's good to be back and I'm excited for 2019. So yeah, thanks for joining us this week and we will definitely see you next week. See ya. Bye.